What's up, guys, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Neo Vintage Podcast. I'm Jabril, and I'm here with... Steve, hope everyone's doing well out there. And for you guys who have never seen the show before, we're just two guys that like to talk over the biggest stories in gaming, but we always like to start with what we've been playing. So, Steve, let me know what you've been playing. Uh, yeah, so, you know, continuation on, on most of the stuff I've mentioned before. Uh, still playing uh, a little bit of that Scarlet like Nexus, uh, which I'm glad the world has been able to kind of experience and join back in. Uh, to that, I don't have much more to say that I haven't said before. Um, so just really good game. I'm I'm enjoying it a little bit more. Things have started sort of falling into place. That like the terms and all that kind of stuff. It's been used enough where it's sort of become second nature to me. Characters make a little bit more sense to me. Um, it's still super anime-ish, but uh, everyone's finding out. Uh, so it's uh, but it's still a really good game. I, I'm I'm glad that now it being on Game Pass, more and more people are. are finally be able to play it and kind of see that it's a really good game i it's such a weird thing that they waited a couple months before putting on game pass where i feel like it probably would have boosted it uh maybe day one um but uh we'll, we'll have to see where that um but i have not much more to say that i haven't uh especially since last time when they said they did that one giant patch uh fixed a lot of my issues um also i spent uh the last weekend so not this weekend but uh the one between shows uh, i was still on that halo infinite uh flight testing so i yeah was i saw that selected selected uh was selected for that as well again um uh, i'm i'm really in there i'm like i get all the, the the things and the emails for they want all my uh like reactions and thoughts and stuff but i did play that weekend which was a big team battle which is where we got the 12 on 12 Oh, wow. uh, we're, we got some of the big maps uh, we got the vehicles and let me tell you I've had so much fun with it and and I know many people are using the same terms over and over where it's like oh it feels like a true sequel to 3 I feel like it's more of a marriage of like some of the good stuff that was from Halo 4 and 5 um, but a lot of that groundness uh, that was in Halo 3 as well um, and, it, and it's really fun man I, I can't wait for this game to come out just because I know the flights as open as they were uh, you still had to kind of go through some emails and hoops to get the invite um, but I can't wait to like on launch day load this up with a few people and play um, even even like the people who aren't like say they're not that great Halo is kind of a difficult uh, multiplayer shooter to oh, do yeah. but the arena aspect of it has been really fun yeah uh, capture the flag where you can especially like these objective based they also had um i forgot what they called it but it's uh basically domination abc you had to collect the three things um like you've seen in all the colleges i forgot what the halo called it but it was <laughs> domination um and it's really fun you know the, the fact that you can jump into these games and focus on something even if it's your focus on protecting our flag or protecting one of the bases sneaking in and collecting one of these you know uh points you know to fill up and try to get all three control points and not having to be like oh my kd is the you know the way that hey the way it hill infinite is really not even focusing on it like you obviously your kills your assists and, and your deaths are there but the fact that you can get like not necessarily xp but like get the different challenges and bonus points and just helping out the team especially in big team battle when you're going 12v12 really makes sense where you don't feel like oh because i died eight times and only got two kills i did nothing um when you were one you know whether you were driving the warthog or driving the mongoose or getting any of these tanks to protect the flags i think the game is really opening itself up to that i think the kill to, uh you know the time to kill is really well done i think it's it's that r perfect sweet spot where I feel like other games are too short and too twitchy to get it, and then other games uh, take too long for it. And I think Halo really does have a good spot, and I think once this game fully uh, launches, I don't know if they're going to do another flight. Um, it'll be really exciting to see, like, like I'm not good at killing things. I'm like, well, are you good at maybe collecting good weapons for your team, and or maybe you're good at driving? Um, some of this stuff still needs to be kind of ironed out. I think driving the Warthog feels a little funky. Um, I don't know if it's because I've played all these other betas and stuff that jumping around feels a little uh, weird. Um, but there's just something about it. All the systems work together where I've been able to, you know, grapple hook a weapon, use it, drop it, jump into, you know, a warthog, mow people down, get the flag and have a guy come back and then pretty much escort me without having to say anything. Uh, escort me back to the base and, you know, we got the point. It's just like a lot of this natural fun. Where it's not all about what KD you have. Do you have the gold gun? 
and all the stuff that's kind of just spoiled the fun for so long. Um, it's good to be back in that original just fun, uh, you know, and it's really great. Um, so dabbled a lot in that. Uh, I was glad I was able to do that again. I don't know if there will be another flight. I, I don't think so. Uh, we are still two months away from launch, so maybe they will do something. Actually, we're only like a month and a half, actually, um, <laughs> from launch. But uh, So we'll have to see. I don't know if they're going to do a complete, complete open. It wouldn't be a beta, I guess, at that point. But it's been really, really good time. Um, but uh, obviously, speaking of betas, I did. Ha I kind of felt like I had to uh, test out Battlefield 2042's beta. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, and I've never been a big Battlefield guy um, for their multiplayer. I've been a big fan of like their campaigns uh, as well and, and things like that. Um, but uh, especially like Battlefield One, I believe I had I really liked the way they did their campaign. So Battlefield 2042, this year's Battlefield's pure multiplayer. Um, and in my experience, Battlefield betas have always been some of the worst things to do. Uh, usually, graphically, they're pretty bad. They're, the stability's not there. Uh, the models are funky. Uh, they're usually filled with cheaters very quickly. And uh, this year, none of that changed. Um, the Battlefield... Now, I tried it twice. I did try it on PC, and I also tried it on my Series X. And both, I'm saying, grenades falling through the maps. I was falling through the maps. Parachutes not opening. Uh, warping across the stages. Uh, you know, the graphics look fine when they were all working really well. That engine we know looks really great. Um, but there's just something where this beta has convinced me that I'm not getting this game. Um, <laughs> which is the worst thing to say. Because not only is, not only for, you know, next gen and all that stuff, is it, I think, launching at 70. Um, there is no campaign. There is no nothing. There's just a few modes. And it's just straight multiplayer. Um, I just, nothing about this beta showed that I want to play this game, or that it's for me. Um, you know, the the UI is, is really bad, um, it just made no sense to me. It was weird that some things felt like better on console, but felt terrible on PC, and vice versa. The way the menus worked, uh, the loadouts made no sense. The fact that it just didn't stable, you know, I couldn't really get a stable connection the right way. Um, and I get it's a beta, it's an old build and all that kind of stuff, but just it doesn't, sh nothing even if it was polished felt like it was going to be great. And the gimmick, which is the tornado coming and hitting the map, it, I don't know, it just did nothing for me. I opened my parachute, I flew around the tornado, it's super easy to cheese to survive, but you really can't do anything. Um, so as cool and as you know nice as some of these small ideas were for Battlefield 2042, None of it speaks to me, and none of it's directed towards me. So I don't want to like say the game is terrible. I, it's just the game has shown that it is nowhere near uh, for me. Uh, besides, you know, it looks fine. It looks good. It looks like most Battlefield games. I don't think it's gonna blow anyone away because it, it just just didn't make sense. So it's not directed towards me. Again, not a shot towards them. I'm hoping the game launches in a way better state. Uh, I remember Battlefield 4 suffered a lot of that at launch. Um, so we'll have to see how that really works out for them. So we'll have to... I'm, I'm excited to see what the community thinks of it a little bit more when it goes on. I think there's a beta going on this week, and I'm not sure if it ended last night or what have you. But I'm curious to see what those people really think of it, those diehard Battlefield fans, um, which I'm not. So uh, I, I don't want to say too much more on that. So, um, yeah, the last thing I have been playing this weekend, Far Cry 6. Far Cry 6 is out. And I'm no, not the farthest in. Obviously, it's a big game. Uh, slight controversy I see on like, some of the reviewing um, process where I see some people reviewing it really well, but also complaining. And I'm not sure if it's just like the build that they played, uh, you know, when influence and stuff get these games, you know, they don't get the day one patch. Uh, I've been playing it, Series X, obviously. Um, shout out to Warrior 64 because I got it on a discount like a year and a half ago, apparently. I got it way cheap i i, I forgot until uh, until i saw the receipt but um this is maybe and i'm very early maybe probably my favorite far cry game i'm oh, i'm already very confident to say that where I, and i'm a huge fan of the series i really liked what one and two did three was actually my favorite for a long time uh four i dabbled in five was way different with the, the mechanic you know just sort of the environment and that open fields um, which I know you played. I did not play the single 
um, the New Dawn. I did not play New Dawn, so I don't have much to say. But from Speaking. what I remember, what you t- from what you told me, yeah, uh, <laughs> there's no need for me to play New Dawn. <laughs> Let me tell you, I cannot suggest Far Cry Six enough. I, I from just the get go, it, it was amazing. Um, patches, I got everything done, uh, installed on day one. Got to play a lot of it, obviously, the next day. And from the speed of getting you from the beginning to the start, like where you're actually playing the game, is so quick. And I think it's done really well. Where you're not spending a lot of time, like, I, like I always really didn't like the beginning of Far Cry 5, where you, like, come down in the church and you walk into the church and you gotta listen to him talk. And I understand that it's sort of setting up the, the world and who uh, the father is and stuff like that. This one we know from the get go, from the cover, you know, Giancarlo Esposito is the main villain. Uh, well, so far. Um, so they show a lot of propaganda. The way it's shown, like a lot of these almost, um, like, I don't know if you've seen the show Narcos, anyone who's seen the show Narcos, a lot of that yeah. propaganda and, and the, the, so, the sort of undertaking of all that stuff just it fits so well. And I'm saying within minutes, you're already playing the game, you're running around, you're doing some sneaking. And the, all the mechanics really work. I know there's some people in a lot of the rev- you know I don't really read that many reviews, but some people that I trust and watch their reviews, you know, say that the mechanics don't make sense and how to equip guns and there's like issues with some of that stuff. I don't un- really understand that complaint. It's pretty spelled out, pretty simple with for me. Um, but I think one big thing is that Far Cry has never been afraid to be a game, and I think that's what really gets this going. I mean, from the trailers, you know, there's. You know the the wheelchair dog chorizo and there's um the alligator um guapo guapo uh, yeah. guapo um you get him i want to say within the hour first hour and a half yeah. and you know sure there's some disbelief in it but i mean look at these far cry games um <laughs> there is some disbelief and i think some of the most disbelief in this game uh where you know you're getting a few different things and you have a, a partner uh his name his name is juan um who was able to build like these weird rockets out of like nothing? And, and sure, there, this one does have a little bit more of that disbelief, uh, sort of not not fantasy elements, but sort of just like that's it's just it, it like sticks out, but like it it just fits some reason. I don't know if it's just because how ridiculous it seems um, that it just works well. Um, a lot of Easter eggs for the Far Cry franchise. Um, there's a lot of like there's one mission that's almost not copy and pasted from like far cry 2 but it's very reminiscent of far cry 2 it's very early on um and it just really honors the franchise with also moving it forward now i haven't gotten into some of this other stuff that we've seen i know there's like this big um the the rooster uh, the cockfighting mini game i haven't gotten to any of that stuff yet <laughs> so i don't know if that's where like the game starts to lose people but i think from moment to moment and story to story it's one of the strongest Far Cries, I believe. Um, I think even like the minute things, um, you can choose male or female from the beginning. Uh, you're still Danny regardless. But I think the small touch of making the story scenes, like those pre, like you know the pre-renders and stuff like that, in third person, I think is a good time because you spend a lot of time actually seeing your character, you're seeing your armor, what you chose and stuff. Where Far Cry, I want to say three through five you always are doing everything was always first person you never saw what your character looked like and i think it adds a little bit more depth to these characters when you see it that way um also just the environment as well far cry there's always something about far cry being in like that jungly like island stuff that really always spoke to me uh, which is something we saw really with the first four far cries um that sort of return to form uh, just makes more sense which I was all for Far Cry 5. I really liked that game. Um, it was one of my biggest games that year. But it was just so... Such a shift in tone. Where this one kind of returns back to it. Where it's jungly. When the sun's setting. The way the, the whole landscaping looks. I think it's just really solid. I think it. I think this game pulls you in really really quickly. Um, you know from... You have all the Spanish music playing. And all the, the Spanish terms that... that you know a lot of spanish culture share a lot of these elements um so it's fun to see that uh seeing some of these songs play on the radio uh and all this stuff just really works together and it's something that i can easily recommend this game for certain people um i don't know if you picked it up but i know when you eventually do get to play far cry 6 you're gonna see exactly what i'm talking about and i would be astounded if for some reason you didn't <laughs> have a great time with it but and that's all from maybe under six hours that i've got from it um it's just hitting everything really well so 
that's all I've been up to. I know I took a little more time than uh, <laughs> I thought, but it's just I've been kind of playing a lot uh, in these last two weeks. It's Broketober's really happening now with uh, all the releases. For so, sure. uh, yeah, what have uh, you been playing? What do you I have guess, been up to? Yeah, I guess I'll just kind of pick up from where you left off. I mean, you, you're not sure if I jumped into Far Cry. Come on, Steve. Come on. <laughs> I had this installed literally the moment that it could be installed. Um, good, good. Yeah, no, I, I like it a lot. Um I'm pretty much almost completely positive about it. it it's uh, it's very much when I, I think about Far Cry, it's like a if if it ain't broke type situation where they kind of established a format and a formula in the third mm-hmm. one in terms of just the gameplay loop. Obviously, the environments change drastically the way their characters are, but in terms of just the general gameplay loop, they set it up in three, and they haven't diverted too much from that, whether it be via the numbered entries or the DLC. Um, and so it stays in line with that, and I think it does it very, very well. And thankfully, I feel like they spaced them out enough to the point that it doesn't feel like I'm playing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I like it quite a bit. Uh, in terms of like the technical issues, I've heard some of the stuff people were describing online. I haven't had it as that bad, but I have had technical issues. Um, like at one point, I left. I just pressed uh, the e- e- exit button to get out of a car, and I was launched to the highest point of the map. Like, in the sky. Just, like, launched into the sky. And so I, I kind of just sat there and, and, like, pushed back. I'm like, wait, what what the hell is this? I was like, I was like, can I escape this? But my character wasn't dropping. But uh, it could be quickly fixed by just fast traveling to any point in the map. So th- that was kind of really funny. So th- those mm-hmm. small things like that, you know, some pop, crazy popping at moments. But nothing insane. Uh, nothing that's kind of abnormal for a game this size, uh, this close to launch. So... I'm sure within, you know, a couple of weeks, this will be completely patched out by that point, uh, especially with a company on the size of Ubisoft or anything like that. Uh, mm-hmm. But, yeah, I, I like it. Now, for anybody who is, like, questionable about, like, Far Cry, like, hey, I haven't liked it for a while, or they don't really quite go there for me where they set up these scenarios, but they don't really go all the way, I don't think Far Cry 6 is going to do it for you, really. Um, if, if you thought that, like the some of the cultural commentary of five didn't fully go all the way then i don't think six is going to remedy that for you because obviously mm-hmm. you play as a guerrilla against like a authoritarian government but they don't really from what my experience is go much deeper uh than that other than the fact that it's a violent authoritarian state there's no real like political cultural commentary there in terms of one faction versus another uh they play a little bit with the ideas of like power vacuums afterwards once you get a little bit of deeper into the game about uh when they if they are able to uproot this government the fact that there's going to be generational kind of uh disturbance and inequity that's going to take some time to solve and that they're going to have to be part of the solution it's not something that you you know you kill this guy and it fixes so i appreciate it from that regard that they uh they're going a little bit deeper than before but uh i i've seen some of the critiques of people and no far cry is not reinventing the wheel with this one but i think Mm -hmm. um i think they have a really nice thing going um one thing i was curious was and i get curious about this for all is what it looks like when a franchise makes a generational jump on some new hardware. So I was like, I, I'm curious how this is look. I'm playing this on a PlayStation 5. Um, obviously, resolution-wise, it's really high. But I, in terms of just kind of a performance way, it doesn't feel leagues uh, ahead of what the PS4 counterparts were capable of. Um, and so that's mostly because, obviously, this isn't a transitional state. There is last-gen versions of it, and they're not. They're mostly resolution and some frame rate differentials. There's nothing much different than that. Uh, it's not like, you know, Far Cry's doing any kind of ray-tracing crazy stuff on the next-gen versions. Or well, I guess it's current-gen now. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, I'm really positive about Far Cry. Um, I've, I've been a fan since 3, and I've liked all of them since then, pretty much. Uh, so there was no doubt in my mind that I was probably going to like 6 a lot. But for I feel like 6 is a great transition for anybody who played 4 and 5, and it just wasn't really connecting with them. Uh, I feel like 6 might. Because 6 invokes the same spirit as 3, in my opinion. Uh, and, and you nail down the head when you're kind of like running through the forests um, and, and, and fighting. And almost that kind of like Latin flavor <laughs> that the third one has. Uh, 6 obviously has pretty much exact analogs to that as well. Um, so for anybody that's kind of on the fence that like, hey, it's been a really long time since I've liked the Far Cry game. If you liked 3, chances are it's been enough time. You're probably going to like 6. Uh, because... 
obviously four being in the mountains of I think Nepal or something like that and you know five being in I think like Montana or something like that uh, this one I feel like is actually a return to form for Far Cry if anything um, so yeah not reinventing the wheel or anything like that so if you didn't like the ones before uh, or if you don't like Far Cry in general then this one's not going to fix it for you but if it's been a while and you um, want to return in some form I feel like there's a great refresh point for the fr- uh, franchise in general so uh, yeah and I'm pretty deep uh there's like an intro section i won't get into spoilers but there's like an intro section and then you are introduced to the totality of the map you have three directions to go from there and i'm like decently into the first point of that so that's kind of where i'm at in the franchise anybody who's playing the game will and got a little bit deeper will know what i'm talking about um and then I got a number of other things I played that I'll kind of just blast through. Uh, Scarlet Nexus, I jumped into via Game Pass. I'm not deep enough to say like definitively what my thoughts are on it, but so far I'm very positive about it. Very anime. Um, I like the yeah. yeah. I love the telekinesis power stuff. Uh, it's running great on Series X. It's a beautiful game. I like the world. Um, so so far I'm very positive about it, uh, but not too much to report quite yet. Uh, I beat Origins. Uh, so finally I'm done with my Assassin's Creed playthrough um, generally I think it's a pretty solid game so I, I actually it's, it wasn't my favorite so I didn't like Origins as much as I thought I was which was I mean it blew my mind that I didn't like it as much as I did and I actually liked Unity more than I thought I was going to so mm-hmm. that's why returning to the franchises are, is so interesting because a lot of what you would assume to be the case is not really the case always um, and I feel like Maybe Origins, unfortunately, I'm coming in with the bias of having played the two successors to it. So I feel like they took Origins formula and changed it and worked upon it and improved it in so many ways that going back to it, it's not as transformative as if you experienced it in real time and went from or, uh, Unity to Syndicate then to Origins, uh, how much of a breath of fresh air that must have been at that time. Where now, because that's such an established format for Assassin's Creed, it's not as mind-blowing for me so going back if anything i'm just seeing some of the shortcomings that they've since rectified uh because it's still the same loop that exists to this day valhalla in in essence is the same gameplay loop as origins uh as the same as odyssey um but in many ways they've introduced some quality of life improvement since then um and and so it puts it a little bit of a disadvantage there but i really like bayek i love aya i love the way that the assassin uh, kind of came to be. It did not pop up in the way that I thought it was. It shows up very much later into the game than I thought it was going to be. Um, so, if anything, you kind of experience the very kind of birth of the Assassins. And then from there, you'll have to fill it out with kind of the extra game lore by reading and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, no, I'm, I think they do some amazing things narratively in that that uh, I quite enjoyed. Uh, also, I guess pronounced Kana. So, Kana, Bridge of Spirits. Um, I uh, beat. Yeah. Well, very, very, very positive about that game. Pro- uh, definitely in my top five game of the year for sure. I don't know if it, I'm ready to say it's my game of the year number one quite yet. Uh, but it's certainly in my top five. I think they did a phenomenal job. At no point did it really miss significantly for me. It, it was just great from beginning to end. Did not overstay its welcome. It's an appropriate length. Great price point for it uh yeah ember lab absolutely killed it so I, I got nothing but pretty much praise for that game um and what i love is that they introduce new abilities and concepts throughout the entirety of the game so finally when you do that last battle and i obviously won't do any further spoilers than that you have this amazing arsenal of abilities that are just really fun to use uh, and it, it feels like an incredibly dynamic and fun game that I'm really impressed with, considering the size of the team that is outputting this. That this fe- To me, I, I know some people say, that, and we covered this last week, that they said that it felt like a PS2 game. Like, I don't, I beat the game now, and, and I've returned to it <laughs> since then, and I don't know what they're talking about at all. Like, I really don't. <laughs> Like I and again, you and I, we re- regularly return to that era of games. I don't know what the hell they're talking about, um, other than maybe the mascot platformery type sections, I guess. But other than that, like I don't know what they're talking about because uh, the combat is incredibly kinetic and uh, dynamic. The enemy variation is really high and diverse. Great storytelling, um, great character design. An amazingly realized and well-designed world tons of different collectibles and different things you can do like I, I don't know but this game feels 
pretty much spot on, uh, and, and no significant critiques there for me personally. Uh, did you beat Kano yet, or are you you're still working on it? No, yeah, I for some reason forgot, but yeah, I'm I'm still working on it, and uh, I I agree with everything you've said with it, obviously. Um, that the one only time I've ever think I understand what people mean when it's like a PS2 are those like weird platforming sections where. I'm like I, I sometimes just the the slight floatiness of her grabbing the ledge and stuff I'm like well maybe this is what they're talking about where it's not yeah. the tightest but uh come on come on <laughs> yeah there and there's yeah I I mean I suppose when you are dropped into these almost like these linear arenas to kind of find things and play around with and do these puzzles I guess that's can evoke the spirit of that kind of era but at the same time i feel like the way everything's interconnected where like they have a fast travel system but if you really want you could like walk from one section to the next all the way through if you wanted to that to me kind of changes it for me where it's like it's an open it's a contained open world uh but at the same time i don't really feel that it, it felt that restrictive uh if anything the nature of the fact that it's not this massive triple a experience uh, might might be more a result uh, of some of the limitations rather than it being like dated at all, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, very positive on Kana. Uh, also, when I beat everything, you know, Origins and Kana, but Far Cry wasn't quite out yet, uh, I decided to go back to GTA 4. Do not ask me why. I had it installed mm-hmm. on my Xbox all this time because I keep it on there because I wasn't done with it. And I was like, ah, let's go back. And um, I beat it. I love it. I mean, I don't have any major thoughts. It's GTA 4. I've played it a million times. Um, but yeah, I love it. Uh, and But for the first time in, I mean, really long time, I'm actually, I went back to Battle to Gay Tony. Um, so I'm actually yeah. playing that right now. Uh, that's a little bit on pause, obviously, because I have a crap ton of brand new games to play. Uh, I'm going to return back to that at some point. But I mean, nothing but praise for that. The those are some of the most iconic DLCs of all time. So everybody, I'm not introducing any new concepts there other than the fact that Battle of Gay Tony and Lost in the Damned are really good. Um, uh, some would make the argument better than the base game, which I don't think is necessarily a stretch. Um, not really, yeah. And yeah, I've been playing Far Cry. And then finally, uh, I can wrap up. And I won't give all my thoughts here because that ties into the first story, but I've also been playing Metroid Dread. Um, and I would say no significant critiques for this game whatsoever. Uh, I think they nailed it on pretty much every front uh, that I would want them to. Um, this is as far, and I and I know this might sound a stretch, but this is damn near a perfect two D Metroid game for what I'd want, pretty much. Um, mm-hmm. And I recently went back to Fusion and Samus Returns to kind of just get a feeler for where it was, so I can get kind of like a exactly how much progress has been made and i mean i think they took a lot of the in awesome mechanics that were introduced in samus returns uh on 3ds and brought it onto an even better feeling engine um but yeah it feels like a sequel to fusion in all the best ways the way when the emmys chase you is horrifying uh, the world is masterfully designed anybody who plays Metroid or Castlevania knows how much level design is just integral mm-hmm. to the the system and yeah they, they absolutely killed it here um, I'm surprised by the difficulty at times thankfully the Castlevania collection has recently come out so I've been playing a lot of these type of games recently so it's a kind of fresh in my mind so I've been able to make pretty fast progress out of this game however there are some points where I'm like playing it and I'm like man I feel bad for people who don't play games like this um, because uh, I've, I've done some boss fights where it's taken, you know, six or seven tries, and that, like, I'm passing it by, like, the skin of my teeth, and I'm, like, thinking, I'm, like, oh, man, for people who don't play, like, Metroidvanias, like, this I could be, I could see being quite brutal, uh, so it is not necessarily the most forgiving game, but for the most part, if you are familiar with Metroid in any way, or Castlevania, any games like this, you're gonna be, you're gonna do okay. Um, and uh, I love the way the, the design, the backtracking, the ability. The abilities are fairly conventional, so uh, it's not a spoiler to say where I'm at in terms of my abilities because I think that's the best spoiler for re- uh, spoiler-free way to say where I'm at in the game, where I just got the Morph Bomb. So anybody who's super deep in the game or knows about the game, uh, that, that'll that tell you where I'm at. Uh, I just got the Morph Bomb. So, uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, I guess you could have a critique that, like, hey, the the abilities are for the most part for the same. But I would say that each Metroid game's 
unique abilities don't really get introduced until much later into the game anyways i would say the first 75 percent are pretty much always the same you know what i mean you you got your morph balls your high jump um uh your wide blaster for sometimes um missile abilities it, it's pretty much the same type of abilities at first and then late game is when the newer stuff are introduced so metroid dread very well might have its own unique abilities i just haven't got there yet uh but yeah the game is gorgeous um I would say it's the perfect game to come out with the OLED, uh, and we'll, we'll go into that later. Um, but just the way the colors pop and the, the darks, uh, so like the dark non-illuminated sections, sometimes you go to these areas, not really a spoiler, but where the power is off, so those blacks are just, it's really dark. It almost reminds me of like a Doom 3 level of space darkness, if that makes sense. Um, and yeah it's just amazing i played it both docked and handheld my preferred is handheld unless i'm doing something really active like a boss fight or fleeing emmy where then i feel like the added screen space of having it docked into the tv is preferred um but yeah i would i would say overall uh i'm overwhelmingly positive about it no major issues with it whatsoever i think the load times are a little bit long uh, but I think that's more on the hardware and less on the game itself. Uh, but this, I think, is a proof, another set of proof that Nintendo knows how to extract insane power out of this device. Because meanwhile, while a lot of games are starting to insanely chug on the Switch, this game, once it loads, I haven't experienced a single dropped frame whatsoever. No performance wow. issue whatsoever. Wow. It is smooth. Uh, it is one of the, it, it, I mean, especially with the OLED, because of the screen being so clear and those colors popping, it almost makes it look like the, the graphics are better when I know that's not the case, but it almost makes it, it feel like that because it's so bright and dynamic where these environments feel so sharp. They're not pixely. They're not ugly. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed with what they did and I have pretty much nothing but praise for it. No, well, yeah, that's, that's awesome here. Again, uh. We, we talked about it off the air. Uh, my Metroid Dread and my Switch OLED is uh, yeah, lost sucks. in the ether. There, we're not really sure where it is. Um, and I, I was feeling a little bummed out, but then I, you know, went on Twitter and I saw like uh, I Justine and stuff like that. Hers is also just like MIA through FedEx and stuff. So I, is it an Amazon thing or is it uh, just a shipper I, thing? They're 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 not really sure. I, I've contacted uh, on both ends and. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Amazon guarantees like, oh well, if you if it doesn't appear, we'll give you your money back, obviously, or else I'll call my credit card company. Oh, of course, um, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I'm not like the worst bummed out. Obviously, if this was like a Switch, like proper pro, I'd probably be losing my mind a little bit. Um, but I did go a little hands on with it, uh, luckily. But um, you know, we'll jump right into the first story when we can continue uh, through it. Which uh, the first topic of the week, obviously, the Switch OLED came out. Uh, it's officially out, and we've. Uh, Obviously, you've gone way more hands-on with it. I've not only done my research, I did get to, uh, luckily, use one for like an hour and a half. Um, my friend who did get theirs, uh, luckily enough, they were able to just walk into Target and get it. They they claim. I, I don't know so how much I believe that. Um, so, I mean, I'll have a, a quicker thought, so then you can... I mean, you're the handheld guru. You're the guy to <laughs> yeah. go to for this. So, um, obviously... It, it's weird at first when you grab it because it's like <laughs> it's just a switch it, it, you know for while it's off and while it's all there it just feels like a regular switch um obviously i brought mine as my my original switch obviously i was testing out different things um and you know just the little things that where people were talking about like the less wiggle of the joy cons inside that uh in, in the slide mechanic um i felt them to be the same so i don't know if it's just my friend spends a lot of time putting his in and, in and out um, but uh, coming down to the upgrades, uh, that kickstand, though I never play my Switch in do uh, what are they, tabletop mode, yeah. um, I, I I think one time I played my Switch <laughs> that way. Um, so that new stand is really nice uh, for that. If that's how you play again, that wasn't something that really sold me because I, I don't think, and I don't think you do either, I play in tabletop mode. If I'm going to tabletop, I'm just going to dock and play out of my TV. Um and that was really for all the mechanic wise and i know you know i, te I tested all the speakers and stuff and all these things that just were slightly different um obviously it all comes down to the screen uh i launched up mario kart 8 on mine and then i launched it on that oled let me tell you woo, 
that is that is a gorgeous looking screen not only you know you you hear when i think we it was going from like a 6.2 screen to a, a full 7 inch um which doesn't sound like much um but you know, my goodness that screen is giant it is huge um so i can only imagine um obviously you and i are big uh vita fans so we we, we understand the real difference when you're going from these uh these oled screens to the the, the other screens um, which where Vita went th the opposite direction, switch is going forward, actually giving you the OLED screen, and you know obviously the colors are so nice. Uh, he, he, I was looking at different tracks in Mario Kart. I'm not sure why Mario Kart was the one I chose. Oh, it's because we were able to do it side by side, and you know the stages that are a little bit darker, you can tell are, f I, for a lack of a better term, were more of a crisp black. Um, and I know you know what that means, and hopefully people who've seen. The difference in the way the you know OLED screens uh, don't light up the darkness um, really works well. Um, so I think it's such a nice package moving forward. Um, you know, I checked out. I was really interested. Some I don't know why uh, into the dock into the new dock, um, which I'm curious if how many thoughts you have. And I know it's sort of almost like an afterthought for that. Um, not only just the design, uh, the just the minute like design changes to. Uh, avoid rubbing a little bit of stuff on the screen because I had an issue with my first switch actually my launch switch uh, where the dock was scratching up my screen I had to buy um, a little sock to go over it um, you know famously everyone called it the dock sock um, <laughs> uh, to avoid that um, but yeah it's you know I'm, I'm very mixed on it where I'm Yes, I still want mine to appear, <laughs> obviously, but I'm I'm almost a little mixed where it's like, why didn't they go that extra step and give it? Because I tested it. Because sometimes Nintendo is very tongue in cheek, you know. Uh, you, the load times are the same uh, and all this other stuff, and they're they're not saying it's not. But sometimes you know you get a small surprise uh, with Nintendo, and you know load times seem to be exactly the same. Um, it does really all come down to that screen. Um, so. I'm I'm interested. I'm confused. Uh, I'm glad people are taking the dock apart because uh, I don't know if you've seen some of the stories that there is some technology in the dock that yeah, would could update. Yeah, can update to some 4K compatibility, which brings the whole rumor. And I know we go through this every year. I think since we started this show, um, you know, Switch Pro is coming out. You know, next month, next year, blah blah blah. Um, which I mean, it's a drinking game at this point <laughs> with the, the amount of times that comes up. But now it's like, well, you know, and there was the whole dev kit situation that happened. That Nintendo came back and said, no, this wasn't specifically true. Um, again, it's it's a mixed bag, and I'm excited for you know the OLED to you know to be the next member in the family of you know you have the Switch, Switch Lite, now we have the OLED. Um, I just don't know if they really want to juggle four switches, um, so. The rest I'm gonna leave in your hands. What? Tell me about the Switch OLED. Like I said, you've always been that handheld guru. You've the guy. Anytime I've had any question, I was not even aware of like uh, Game Boy Advance SPs, like the 101. AGS 101, the, yeah. The front light and back light stuff. That's stuff that, thanks to you, I learned. So you can take it away for the rest of the story. Yeah, yeah. Handheld's my world. So uh, I was really, really excited about this because this this switch is essentially designed for people like me who play switches predominantly in handheld um and so i was really excited to not only see you know how the experience is but uh what specifically about it would be the most transformative and what do i notice the most so uh, i'll kind of just break it down step by step so first off obviously the screen very very impressive uh the bigger thing is rather than the colors that impressed me the most which uh it's very impressive the size yeah as you mentioned is probably the thing that kind of caught me most off guard which is just how big it feels um once you're playing and it really does make that much of a difference so i was really impressed by the size just getting rid of those bezels bezels i just never imagined would have made the experience that much better um also i noticed the in-hand feel for mine is very different on the back of it um it, it feels like a grainier metal uh, than my original that felt like a smoother plastic. I don't know. I it, There's nothing wrong with mine, so it's not that I think there's anything mm -hmm. wrong. But the in-hand feel feels way different on the back of the actual Switch device, not the Joy-Cons. Um, I like the kickstand. Pretty impressive. I never play tabletop mode. I don't like tabletop mode. It's stupid. <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't call it stupid. It's just it's not for me. Um, 
so I, I don't use that at all but I did play around with it and check out the kickstand and it's very very well built um, and and so it's just honestly the way that it probably should have been the whole the whole time uh, so I'm glad that that's been added the sound I haven't been able to really notice that much of a difference I've kind of played around with it and increased the sound um, I suppose there, there's probably a, it gets a little bit louder, uh, but I wouldn't say it's like night and day uh, specifically. However, I play predominantly with headphones, so if someone was more used to the original sound of the Switch, I think maybe they'd be able to tell a difference. I can't really tell a difference based on what I've done so far. Um, I played in both regular and vibrant mode. I actually really do like the vibrant. I know some people have had some critiques of it that it makes things look a little bit oversaturated and not true to the colors i personally have kind of like it that way um especially with games that are not an immense amount of different colors clashing to each other like a metroid dread for example where there is a lot of grays and blues reds and greens uh it makes the reds and greens pop out so much better against those darker blacks grays blues whites uh that i think just it looks phenomenal so i like the vibrant mode a lot but i know you know your mileage may vary on that and certain i think games look kind of comically <laughs> vibrant uh with vi that on uh no pun intended um like link's awakening for example i loaded that up that looks insane on the oled um it because it, it's already a very bright game um, and so when you throw that on the OLED, it was almost like blindingly bright where I was like, okay, I could see turning off the bright, vibrant or maybe decreasing the brightness a little bit if I was going to play for an extended period of time on the OLED um, because it just, it, it's, it's a bit too much there. Uh, Breath of the Wild looked great. I liked it. Um, no major complaints there, obviously, or I mean, no complaints in general, but uh, the experiment was really great. Uh, and then, yeah, I also fired up Mario Kart. That was probably one of my favorites uh, to play on the Switch OLED. Um, mm -hmm. It And I played, I obviously went straight to Rainbow Road because I wanted to really see those colors pop. Um, and again, it's the screen size to me that really makes the difference here. Uh, sure, I mean, the, the, the OLED screen is an insane upgrade. Um, but uh, I, I feel like the, the just that sheer size in a game like that is just phenomenal and it, it really transforms the handheld experience experience for me uh personally so i also checked out the dock and i really wanted to compare it um to the original and i so i did a couple things so first off i i had my original switch in its original dock and my oled in its original dock and i kind of just jiggled them already and there is a significant amount more space uh, with the new dock compared to the old dock in my experience because uh, I also took the uh, my original switch and put it into the OLED's dock and it's the same thing so it's the dock it's not the switch uh, because okay. now I, I and I know that the form factor is almost the same between the OLED and the original uh, it's just ever so slightly longer um, by like a millimeter or two so it's nothing significant uh, but I just wanted to double check so yeah it's uh, they give you a lot more space in there it fits snugly in the way that once you dock it in there it's not like moving around but if you were to put your finger on it and kind of move it back and forth it can clank against the sides a little bit more which means that it's not coming up straight against your thing so any scratching issues that would have happened in the original one I seriously doubt it's going to happen in this one uh, I think they put some protective mechanisms there uh, it's a well designed dock I have the white one because I got the white joy cons and that's what I love the most is that if I got the neon and red one it would have looked like a carbon copy of my original one which would have sucked uh, yeah. so having the white switch next to my original switch really does make it feel like when I, and I know this is not the case but when I have my series X next to my Siri uh, or my Xbox one s where it's just such a different form factor because these are two different generations it almost feels like that looking next to each other uh, with my white switch in my black switch um but yeah no i'm really really positive i love that i haven't hooked up the ethernet quite yet because i only have one ethernet cable right now and i use that for my ps5 uh so i, I would like to check out the download speeds at some point uh but for right now i think it's a great upgrade i'm really happy with my purchase uh but again we are collectors so i try to mark that in my mind as kind of like a biased perspective going in where it's like we are not your run-of-the-mill consumer um, I think mm. if you have a choice between, like, you don't have a Switch and there's an option for an OLED or a regular and you still want to utilize the dock so the light is not really an option for you, then absolutely get the OLED. If you have an existing Switch and you 
are, you know, maybe you don't have a ton of money to throw around and you just want a fun Switch experience. I don't know if the experience is so transformative that I think you need to upgrade quite yet. Um, so I think you might want to hold off. I think if you play exclusively handheld, this can, you could, it's worth the money in that regard if you are really into game fidelity and you play a ton of Nintendo stuff and you just want the most beautiful experience for your the next Mario game, for the next Zelda game, for um, Kirby when it comes out, I think is going to look phenomenal on this console. Um, even like games like Hades and stuff like that really pop on this console. Then I think there you can make the argument that this is a great purchase for you. However, um, you know I ended up with taxes and everything. It's three hundred and eighty dollars, so it's just shy of four hundred dollars. It's not the cheapest thing in the world, um, so it's important to make note of that. That you know, it, it, it's fifty dollars more um, than the or, or original one, and the original one is not an insignificant amount of money already. So, uh, if anything, maybe find a way to sell your original and then uh, use that money towards the OLED. Uh, if you can get the OLED for anything less than you know one fifty, two hundred, I think it's more than worth uh the money personally but uh yeah I'm, I'm very positive about the thing so far uh the more i play it the more i feel like this form factor lends itself a lot to those theories about the the switch pro which it, now playing this makes me very very confident in my theory that the switch pro absolutely did exist once upon a time and mm -hmm. i think nintendo's timetables for the chip shortages were probably off and they were like, crap, this has not rectified itself in the time that we thought it was going to, and we need to pivot. And what did they have versus what didn't they have? Well, they had an OLED screen probably. They had a new form. They had the new device with its 64 gigs of storage and the improved kickstand and all these quality of life improvements. What didn't they have? The chip inside of it for that extra processing power. So what could we do on short notice? just release the existing switch with better hardware or um a better kind of you know just a hardware experience with a better screen and stuff like that with the same processing power thus the switch oled that's my theory um i think they had a last minute pivot and playing this device makes me feel way more confidently on that because it's pretty much a top to bottom improvement on pretty much every metric except for the ability for it to physically run games um, and, and so that's, that's why I feel that way personally, but, uh, very positive about it. No, yeah, that, that's great to hear. And, um, I'm again, still hoping mine comes in. W would I be that distraught if for whatever reason it didn't, I had a wait? Maybe not. I, I, I've been mixed because I do play my switch primarily in handheld mode. I like, I would benefit from those things. Um, but like I have had people ask me like, Oh, I have it. I always play a doc, and I'm like, if you always play a doc, uh, then don't even bother to be honest. I'm like, why? And they're, you know, they just have it as the family council. I'm like, I would not. I was like, I, <laughs> just buy I'm a new like, doc, in my guess, because uh, you'll you'll get the benefit of the sped up download speeds because of the Ethernet port. But other than yeah. that, yeah, just buy the dock separately and buy white Joy Cons, and you essentially have the same experience than that we do because you don't play handheld. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll have to see. And, and again, I, I'll keep you guys updated. I'll keep you updated if uh, yeah. what, I don't know whatever happens. Maybe by the end of today of recording this, it'll show Hopefully. up. But uh, we'll uh, we'll see. Yeah, and I'm just curious about also what their strategy going forward to is because obviously these are sold out in a lot of places. Some people are finding them in stores, but most people are not. Uh, and it makes me wonder what they're gonna do in terms of just production. Like, is the OLED going to be produced as the successor to the baseline units or are they just going to make a whole bunch of OLEDs and a whole bunch of lights or are they going to keep the regular version in um, full production as well so the OLED is going to kind of remain fairly scarce uh, because mm -hmm. their productions are going to kind of be split three ways as opposed to two once upon a time that was my question is like if it's split two ways I could see OLED production being boosted to the point where uh, these will be fairly readily accessible fairly quickly uh, but if this is going to remain that kind of premium high-end device in conjunction with the reg the regular original version, uh, then it's probably going to be quite in demand for quite some time. So hopefully those who want it that don't have some kind of pre-order set up can keep their eyes out there because uh, it's a pretty cool device and I, I could see it keeping its value for quite a while. Yeah, absolutely. 
So I guess we can move on to the next story, and uh, this is also kind of a me story. Uh, mm-hmm. GTA, the trilogy, the definitive edition, formally announced. This was um, rumored for quite a while. Um, and so pretty much it was like they confirmed what was already known. So it felt like very much a Ubisoft moment by this point. Uh, so this mm-hmm. story is written by Matt Kim over there at IGN. So Rockstar Games has officially announced the GTA or Grand Theft Auto, the trilogy, the definitive edition. What a title. Comprising of GTA 3, Vice City, and San Andreas. The updated games will be released for PS4, PS5, Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, and PC. So pretty much everywhere except for Stadia poor guys um via the rockstar right. games <laughs> launcher later this year so as of right now this is slated to be a 2021 game uh, all three games will feature across the board upgrades including graphical improvements modern gameplay enhancements for all three titles while still maintaining the classic look and feel of the originals uh more details will follow in the coming weeks rockstar ha- has not yet confirmed that these games will be released as a single package or as individual titles or both um, the existing versions of all three games will be removed from digital storefronts next week, um, and I'll get to, into that. Uh, but Rockstar also announced that the games will come to iOS and Android uh, in the first half of 2022, so even more platforms are getting it. Uh, so this is actually a pretty cool announcement for any GTA fans. It's a little annoying that I guess they're going to be removing them from digital storefronts this week, but this game this collection won't be coming out until months after it so we're just gonna have these games inaccessible for a couple months and it just seems like a strange move to make when they couldn't they just sync it up like wait a couple weeks and just sync it up so there's no real lapse but whatever that's a small critique other than that uh i'm I'm excited to have this i've actually been wanting a reason to go back to vice city and three specifically for a long time i've gone back to san andreas so many times recently that's i'm I'm good on that, uh, but I've wanted kind of an excuse to go back, and so this is great. Um, for me, everybody's main question, I guess, with this is what are the extent of these upgrades actually going to look like? Because uh, what does graphical improvements and modern gameplay enhancements mean for PS2 games as old as these? I, I don't know. Um, they can't just up it because mm-hmm. the existing versions on PS4 and Xbox are essentially up I think they're running in 1080p or as close to it as possible that those games could run. Uh, and it, it's the same kind of boxy graphics, just as clear as you can get them, I guess. Uh, so my question is, what can you do from that point onwards to clean it up? So that's kind of on them to figure out. I'm excited to see. And the extent of the upgrades kind of also the, uh, will sway where i play it because i would love to be able to play a game like vice city on my switch oled um to see those crazy neon pinks pop on that i think would be amazing uh and to be able to have that hand that full experience handheld and be able to dock it too would be great however Mm -hmm. if there are like insane performance upgrades on like ps4 or ps5 where you can play like 60 frames per second san andreas that might be enough to sway me to actually play on <laughs> PS5, you know what I mean? So it, it entirely depends on what the nature of it. If it's going to be like, you know, 1080p, 30 everywhere, then yeah, I'm just going to play it on Switch. But um, if, if they can extract some real crazy experiences on this uh, with the other pieces of hardware, then maybe that'll sway me to play it on those big box consoles. So uh, what's your thoughts on this? So, yeah, you know, we've been excited for this, uh, I mean, basically since it started leaking. Um, and we knew it existed because it was, like, leaking through, like, ratings boards, which, yeah. <laughs> why would you, you know, put this Pretty legit, to get yeah. rated? Yeah, why would you get this stuff rated if you weren't going to release it? Um, the title is ridiculous. The trilogy, the definitive edition, I think is wild. But, you know, these three games are a big staple, you know, in gaming. This is something that, there's people that this is what they play. It's just they go and play GTA 3 through Andreas 4. Um, and five for the hundredth yeah, millionth day, time yeah. to this day. Um, uh, my biggest curious is, is you know, I, I have I actually gone back to Vice City. Um, at some point, I want to say in this last year, I went to play Vice City again. Just, I don't know, one day I had a weird hankering, downloaded it. Um, and my only issue with the way these games play is just that, the way they play, the feel. How they feel old, the buttons are in the awkward stiffness, spots. Yeah. Um, which makes me curious on like you know the across the board upgrades for graphical improvements modern gameplay and enhancements you know these games were all released um i believe what two years apart so they all really play the same and that's kind of the issue people have with playing these um so if they're really keeping all the controls and stuff the same 
then I would be confused on why even doing this because uh, both on P you can play all three on PS5 through the PS4 Classic or PS2 Classic on through PS4 backwards compat, and Xbox obviously has no issue that way. So the fact that they're removing it, you know, they're removing the whatever legacy titles to replace it with this, and I think it's going to be sold probably um, all together and individual. Um, I've seen most companies do it that way. Yeah. Uh, I'd be surprised if I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they shove them all together and made you buy the package deal but i'm all about what these graphical improvements are um again the graphical stuff's not even the one that kills me i'm really about what is the control like now um because you know <laughs> i gotta play these for hours at a time can i actually play it without it being awkward awkward 2000s graphics um controls mechanisms and obviously the big one yeah where do i get this i would love to have them all on switch i think they'd be really nice there especially when i do end up getting my oled i think i had the same idea with vice city i said oh those colors are probably gonna be just pristine for sure but if it is locked um and i would obviously have to get it uh either on ps5 or series um to get maybe that boost because you got to assume usually when they do these uh, definitive editions, it's always yeah. Now it's at the highest it could be graphically and 60 frames, uh, whether or not it uses it all or not. So that's where I'm really interested in. I'm not surprised that, that it's coming to iOS and Android. I think these three games are the the three games are on those marketplaces already. Yes, they are. I checked um, so not they're too long ago. probably just gonna yeah hand and swap them. But I'm I'm just curious to see what it is. It was weird that they just kind of announced it with that small teaser. And I'm like. This is one of the things that we need a trailer, a side-by-side. -side. What did you really change? Why should we buy these games from you again? I mean, we've bought in GTA V from you multiple times, and now we're finally getting these legacy games. Um, I do hope, and I pretty much have a good feeling in my gut, that we'll probably get GTA IV Definitive Edition, um, which obviously would be packaged in with Battle of Gate Tony and Lost in a Dam, yep. um, because that game right now, I mean, we obviously... Thanks to backwards compat on Xbox, we have no issue. You can't play that unless you hook up your PS3, uh, which is, I mean, uh, if you're a PlayStation player, I mean, obviously, if you're an Xbox player, you're good to go. But if yeah, you like bought me, yeah. that on, yeah, you know, if you were a PlayStation player dying through and that's where you own it and your PS3 died out, you're out of luck and we're two generations later and you can't play your copy of GTA for which is a sin so i'm excited to see what this really equals to I, I just hope that there's a quick announcement as well for that gta 4 um, i don't know if maybe they're gonna wait on the sales i i just don't think they'd have to wait on sales because then you know you're gonna this is gonna sell it's grand theft auto i mean come on oh, it's gonna be great, yeah. <laughs> so it's gonna do great so i'm excited to see a little bit more of it and how much work because we've heard very little you know light rumors it being ported uh to different engines and and to work on it so what does that look like because if you're, if it's if you're gonna go with the trilogy the definitive edition we want the nice stuff i don't want just a repack with again you can only make those block graphics look so good yeah and i guess i mean to kind of wrap it up uh there's only really two months maybe two and a half months left of the year so when they say later this year i mean it's it, if they're slated for 2021 it's gonna be very soon um either i mean I doubt it's late October because I mean we're like that that would make it like two weeks away, uh, but it's either November or December, one of those two. So I'm um, curious to see how that that plays out in terms of it. is it going to slip? Because I mean we're already very late in the year, but uh, I feel like they were kind of forced to announce it because of all the leaks and stuff like that. So it makes me wonder how far and along mm -hmm. into development this was because we've heard these rumors for quite some time so i think this has existed for a while so i don't think there's something they're certainly just starting or anything like that so it doesn't so i wouldn't be surprised if they were like hey you know first week of december or something like that last week of november um you know you could pick up this and believe me i'm gonna get it <laughs> as much as yeah. i w i wish i didn't i wouldn't rebuy all these collections I, i'm a sucker for this kind of stuff so i'm, I'm with it yeah same here all right, uh, moving to the next story. Obviously, this is a story for me if I've ever seen one. Uh, so Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, the last DLC character, uh, you know, we knew this was coming. They did this big presentation in the last Nintendo, Nintendo Direct that we were going to get the last Smash Ultimate character. No more characters at the time for now. Uh, I've, and I think they're sticking to it. They've talked about it being the final presentation. Um, and it's a character I don't think I've ever believed would appear due to the co-writes of disney uh, but yes super smash bros ultimate's last ever dlc character will be sora from kingdom hearts 
announced by series creator Masahiro Sakurai in the final presentation. A new trailer referenced the original Smash Bros. Ultimate reveal, which was the Splatoon uh, Fireball Sun. It showed Mario throwing a fireball that opened a portal, bringing Sora into the world of Smash Bros. Sora will be added to the game on October 18th. Will cost six bucks uh, as standalone, or if you bought the Fighters Pass, obviously he's in there as well. Um, Nintendo also announced that the Kingdom Hearts game will be coming to Nintendo Switch. I got super excited when they announced that, to immediately be disappointed. Uh, the series will be available via cloud gaming, uh, which will allow you to play the series up to and including Kingdom Hearts 3. So the Switch versions will include Kingdom Hearts HD 1.5 plus 2.5 Remix, HD 2.8 Final Chapter Prologue, and Kingdom Hearts 3. So the series will be on Switch. That's uh, that's always a great time. Uh, we, you and I are big fans of the series, uh, though we we have uh, and we both have uh, the same feelings about you know three and how we were let down. <laughs> yeah. Great that the whole franchise is there. I do not understand why they opted to do the cloud. I get, I get it. <laughs> I do get why they go had to do these games via cloud gaming, and I've done some research on why companies do that. It's the same reason Hitman Three couldn't go to Switch normally. And, and I get it. I thought that these games being older, um, or you know, more. I know some these games have been cleaned up and stuff, but they're practically ports. Um, so I'm, I'm super surprised that they're going complete cloud gaming. Um, but yeah, Sora being in Smash Brothers uh, is, is it's it's quite a big deal because for a long time it's been asked. You have to remember before all these HD remix compilations, there was more Kingdom Hearts games on Nintendo devices than there were on any other device at the time yeah. like PlayStation. Uh, PlayStation used to have Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. That was it. Uh, where through, you know, of course, DS and GBA, we had uh, Chain of Memories, uh, 3, 5, 8 Days Over 2, uh, Recoded, uh, Kingdom Hearts 3D. Like, at some point, there was more Kingdom Hearts games on Nintendo consoles than on the console it started. So it only makes sense that, you know, finally, Sora's in Smash Brothers. Uh, Disney was the one always holding it up, apparently, in the conversations, and that's been made more prevalent than ever because uh, in the Kingdom Hearts stage that you get with Sora, uh, which was those stained glass uh, things that obviously we're very familiar with, the locations where Goofy and Donald would be in the stained glass are replaced by, I think, like a tree and some other thing. Um, so uh, Disney was very tight on that, did not give up anything. I was surprised that even the Keyblade had the chain with Mickey's head on it. I yeah. only imagine what Nintendo had to do to get that <laughs> little bit. Sure. Uh, we all know Disney's pretty uh, so protective over that title. So it's interesting, you know, again, all the spirits that come with it and stuff, is it's all the OG characters, Kingdom Hearts, Roxas, uh, Ventus, Aqua, all of them. So no Disney characters. Disney is nowhere up on here. Um, but it's exciting, you know, and I think if there was a character to end the, you know, end Smash Ultimate, I think Sora's a fitting one to be the final one. I've been very mixed on the DLC characters in Smash Ultimate. I think everyone has been. Uh, one, you know, of course, we didn't need any more Fire Emblem characters. Two, it's also been a lot of uh, anime spiky hair swordsmen. Um, and we got, you know, all three big anime spiky hair swordsmen within Cloud, Sephiroth, and now Sora are, are in the game. So, though I know some people were disappointed, uh, I know there were some other rumors that showed otherwise that character's going to be there. I think it's going to be a great time. I, I'm i at that point where I'm like almost just kind of done playing Smash Ultimate. I'll play every once in a while. I will probably play this for a, week's, a week or a couple days straight when Sora comes out just so I can really experience it. And... I'm not mad at being able to finally be like, yeah, all right, Smash Ultimate is done. No more speculation, rumors um, in that community. Um, I would actually be way excited more now for the inevitable uh, reboot of Smash, because uh, I don't know where Smash goes from here, but that's a whole other topic. Um, I know you, lightly playing Smash, it's probably been a while, but uh, what did you think of this announcement? Yeah, so as you said, I'm not really a Smash player, but uh, I do kind of tangentially pay attention to the announcements because I love the character reveals like everybody else. I think it's really fun. Uh, and I, I think Sora's a really awesome way to kind of end it off. Uh, I was hoping, I was like, you guys got to stick the landing because this has been such an insane saga of just this ridiculous roster. And it's like, who's going to be the last one? I was like, it has to be somebody who hits somebody, something people have been asking for a while. And I was like, you know, there's all like the, like people who want like Rayman and stuff like that. And it's like, uh, that can't be the last one. There's no way you end on Rayman, and you know, you and I know I love Rayman, but no offense, mm -hmm. but come on. But uh, so when they showed Sora, I was like, that that's pretty awesome. Um, 
and and yeah i was happy about that and the moment i saw that i was like now please let sakurai le- like rest like oh my god that poor guy <laughs> yeah, <for laughs> like real. It's, honestly for real. it's been brutal for him so it's like uh, i hope that he takes a long rest and if this has to be his last one so be it i think he he went out on such an insane high and this is i mean the most insane smash game ever so uh just congratulations to him first and foremost uh but but other than that uh, i'm not really a smash player so i don't have much of a take beyond that um, on the re- the cloud gaming releases was very very disappointing for me uh, because this is one of the franchises I've wanted on Switch for the longest. Um, I-, I was actually doing a playthrough not too long ago, and I'm actually watching somebody play Kingdom Hearts three right now. Um, I've wanted to go back to these games for a really long time, but kind of just they're not the type of games that I love just sitting at the couch and playing. There's something I'd rather play, you know, in thirty minute, forty five minute bursts and bed or something like that. Um, that's how I prefer it. That's why I loved Birth by Sleep in the, in the back in the day so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that to this day is one of my favorites to this day. Um, and so I've always wanted to go back to them. And so I've always wanted them on Switch. And I knew there was no technical limitations for this because, again, these are originally PS2 games. Then the collections themselves originally came out on PS3. And so people forget that 1.5 and 2.5 are actually ports of a PS3 version. Um, that's true. And so the only actual next-gen games that we got were 2.8 and 3. Um, and so if they were like 2.8 and 3 have to be cloud, I completely understand that. Those are very demanding games. Um, so so be it. I, I mean, obviously, if Nintendo made them, they could make it work. But, you know, it's not always easiest for the third-party people to figure that out. Um, but I, it, it, it was kind of just a ridiculous for 1.5 and 2.5 to have to be cloud too as well. And, I mean, despite what people say, I don't think that cloud is always just a viable option. Like, I don't think it's a viable alternative. I think it's a great thing to be added in conjunction to beef out the library for these games that are obviously too powerful for Switch. Uh, So to to have that as an option, I think is great. But for a game like 1.5, 2.5, there's no excuses. And I've seen a lot of speculation online of why this could be the case. Some people uh, brought up the idea of maybe space concerns, the sheer file size, but... And the fact that it would obviously be too big for the Switch's internal storage. But I would like to remind everybody that that is not the first time that's happened. Uh, 2K straight up ignored that and has a game that's much larger than 30 gigs um, in its based file. Not to say even once you start updating and and DLC and all that for the the game, that game could blow up. And that's much bigger than um, Switch's internal storage. And that didn't really cause any issues for EA or anything like that. Or or 2K, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um so i i don't necessarily think that's that case at all i think nintendo from the beginning was very clear that you should probably get an sd card so i don't think they would withhold an entire skew of a game just because it won't fit on the the base thing so i don't i think this is a time saving and resource uh saving mechanism i think it's not easier but it's quicker to turn around a cloud gaming experience on switch than to actually work on a native port for switch i think that's just mm-hmm. a lot more time and effort on switch it on uh squares part that they're just not interested in doing um which i'm not going to judge them for so much as just say that it's very disappointing i'm not going to say hey you're cutting corners or you need to do this no do what you got to do it's a business but uh unfortunately i think it's very unfortunate and that's absolutely going to keep me from playing it on switch i'm not going to play a cloud version personally um on so i played control on cloud um via my switch and it was actually a pretty solid experience but it was not something that i'm gonna sit and do 25 30 40 hours of there's just no way uh the switch is not there um when we're talking about project x cloud and stuff like that or or luna or stadia that's an entirely different argument but when we're talking about something like switch that is not really built to do that that's an added service to do that uh it's just not something I'm interested or necessarily even that impressed by. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. No, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, and just, just that. I'm, so close, man. It's so close. They were so are. close, man. What an announce? What an announcement is to be like. All right, sma- last final Smash Ultimate character, Sora. Also, the whole series that up to now is coming to Switch via cloud streaming. I'm like, I just, I tried cloud the streaming once as well. I think I did try Hitman Three. Um, and it was just terrible once you, especially that game where you do that, that game, and, and you know, obviously you love, you play those hit that oh, yeah. series. Um, 
a, a one second matters is when someone can catch you doesn't catch you and the fact that it would jitter and it would just <laughs> cause a whole big thing it, it makes no sense um especially when you know we have steam deck on the horizon here and though the kingdom hearts games aren't on steam they are on an epic game store and from what we understand there will be a way to get up, the yeah. epic there will be a way to get the epic game store on your steam deck so i'll be able to just play them download it to my steam deck uh essentially um so we'll we'll have to see they maybe i just i have a friend who's like dying they're like oh they'll release it they will release it uh they're you know resident evil 7 didn't come to switch without the cloud uh control has not been released without a, you know it's only via cloud uh hitman uh there's a there's some other game i forgot but any of these games that have come to switch via cloud version have only stayed cloud version so i don't really think there's much hope uh in this um, again, it doesn't make sense, but it's the world we live in. But at least if you're dying to play it on Switch for some reason in that aspect, you can have that way. If not, just play Smash Brothers. That's it. Boom. Sora. Done. Yeah, it's clear that a lot of developers in Nintendo see the cloud thing as a solution, not as like a time-saving mechanism at all. So, yeah. uh, no. the way it, cloud Kingdom Hearts as a cloud is going to be how it is on Switch, unfortunately. And this is a prime example of what I mean when that power differential between Nintendo consoles and everybody else can be a problem sometimes. And I understand when people are like, hey, they're focused on the game and fun experience. They don't need 4K60. It doesn't matter that much. And I agree with you. But I always, you and I make note of the fact that that disparity can be a problem when there's just mm -hmm. a, that gap can be a problem. And so nobody's asking for Nintendo to be able to run, you know, uh, the newest Call of Duty in, in 120 frames per second. Nobody's saying that. But what we're saying is when you have such a massive gap, you're going to have concessions. So now we're getting into a point. And, and it's not nearly as bad as it was with the Wii U, thankfully, where like they, we, didn't, we straight didn't get games on there. So people are trying to figure out things, but it's going to yeah. have to be these concessions. It's going to have to be these back in the day when they were like dwarfed versions, crappy, weird spawn-off versions. And now I guess the solution to that is cloud versions. But again, like n unless you have that wired, really great connection, it's not a viable solution for you, and we're just not quite there for you. And um, I'm absolutely on board for dedicated streaming experiences on a certain platform like uh, mm -hmm. Luna, like a Stadia, like a Project X Cloud. But I'm not interested in streaming on my dedicated consoles. <laughs> which is like uh, the the PlayStation Nows and now this Switch Cloud thing. It's just not what I'm interested in. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and so that's the unfortunate gap of what I mean, where it's like when you have these massive power differentials, you're going to have developers like this who are just not interested and cannot have that leeway to dedicate that manpower to figuring out the port that's going to have to be fundamentally different than the rest of the thing because the Switch can't support that, unfortunately. Um, now, what yeah. the Switch can and cannot support is a very, obviously... Um, argued upon point because Nintendo is able to do some crazy stuff like with like Odyssey for example that I feel like some developers have not been able to even get any rem remotely close or if you have like a Bethesda for example what they're able to do with Doom uh, as it related to some other games that when they're ported that look just absolutely ridiculously terrible so um, your mileage may vary on that, that front uh, but yeah, this this was a d disappointing one for me. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad those are getting they're getting sore for Smash. That's nice for them. That's it. Yeah. So uh, I guess we can move on to the next story. Uh, this is a pretty fun one. So this is by Andy Robinson over uh, at Video Games Chronicle, and this is a rumor that's been floating around. And so we have some more information. So Konami is set to ramp up its premium game development with new installments and remakes for its biggest franchises, including Metal Gear and Castlevania. That's according to publishing sources who spoke to Video Game Chronicle anonymously because they did not have permission to discuss their projects uh, publicly. Following a restructure in the game's 
the company's game development divisions earlier this year, Konami is now focused on bringing back its biggest brands to premium game space, Video Games Chronicle was told. Uh, the first of these titles will be a new Castlevania game, which sources described as a reimagining of the series currently in development internally at Konami in Japan with support from local external studios. So this is a very interesting story because for anybody who's been paying attention for the game industry for you know a couple years now, knows that Konami has been heading in a very different direction for quite a while now. Uh, for y'all who don't know, Konami is a massive company in Japan, and they do a lot more than just make video games. So they have pachinko machines, and they have all these dedicated brick and mortar stores. They have they do a lot of things, and so video game publishing once upon a time, you know, they just moved away from it because. The reception was rough and the probably the returns, the financial returns were probably not what they were interested in doing quite at that moment. So this seems like a 180 where with this restructuring, I guess there's people at Konami who actually see gaming as an important part of Konami's offerings. And so that they're going to be returning to some of their IP. And the crazy thing is they have such incredible IP that it was a real shame for them to kind of step away from it you know metal gear has been idle for so long and the last one was metal gear survive and what a terrible way to leave such an amazing franchise um mm -hmm. castlevania has been essentially dormant since lords of shadow not including the iphone game um and with games like bloodstain coming back and metroid being back there's a there is a certainly a hunger for castlevania style games especially with these collections too doing so well um, and all these Silent Hill rumors with, you know, Bloober Team and is Kojima working on it and all these things and Sony, are they stepping in and becoming involved? There's a lot of hunger there for Konami IP, so it's great news to hear that they're even playing around with the idea of returning and putting some dedicated resources on it. And I'm, I'm happy to get anything, even if that means them partnering with um, third-party people to get it done. So long as it's the right third-party people, I'm not mad at it at all. Uh, what are your thoughts about it? No, yeah, I mean, this is all great news. Video Game Chronicles usually won't post anything without uh, the guts to stand behind. They're usually pretty reliable. Is for what sure. I'm trying to go for. So they're usually not ones to just say things <laughs> for, for no reason. Um, I mean, these three, you know, especially Metal Gear and Castlevania, um, and Silent Hill to an extent, you know, are big franchises in our lives. Um, I mean, Castlevania, I know, is, su is super important to both of us. Um, yeah, so the fact that franchise. finally we're hoping that these this, these brands and these games are sort of coming back. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, we know Silent Hill is coming back um, with hopefully two. I mean, we know Bluebird Team is doing one. Um, there's Again, there's that other mystery rumor that is another one <laughs> somewhere developed yeah. by someone. Uh, who knows? Maybe it's uh, Hassan and uh, Blue Point. Oh, Studios not or abandoned. <laughs> or not Blue Point. Uh, Blue Box. Blue yeah. Box or whatever. Oh, that whole abandoned I, I can't site. Them. I still have that downloaded on my PS5 for a fun fact. Nothing. Nothing's changed. The app. Um, yeah, that weird app thing they do. Uh, it's it's there. Um, it's, it's just there. <laughs> um, but obviously, you know, I think Metal Gear is. We're in a world where it's like. What do you do with Metal Gear now with with or without Kojima? Who knows? They may have buried the hatchet. I think if the hatchet was rough enough, um, I think maybe Sony would be the ones to help sort of uh, facilitate that. This third party sort of smooth things over. Um, you know, in a world, I could also see Metal Gear coming out without Kojima, which I know to some people is a big, big deal. Um because the last time they did that was Survive, but again, that's you don't want the series to end that way, just the way you said. Um, I, I don't know where you go with Metal Gear. I don't know if you dare reboot it or tell a story not connected. Uh, it's it's rough. Uh, Castlevania, again, that's one that I think will live on the easiest. I think they've got to have seen the sales um, from all the collections they've been doing, the uh, Symphony of the Night and Rondo uh, ports that is weirdly still stru just stuck on PlayStation 5. It, it drives me nuts because on my Switch I have the Castlevania collection, the Advanced collection, and then I just don't have Symphony. It just drives me nuts. Oh, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. That, oh, yeah, I know you're in the same boat. It's just, it drives me nuts that those two, and I have it on PlayStation, but it's like, I want them all together. I want the family. I have my Mega Man, all my Mega Man games, my Mega Man X games, and then I got the Castlevanias, and I'm just missing those two games. Um, but, uh, it's interesting, you know, and I'm just kind of glad Konami is restructuring this. And again, like we've said, through these collections they've been doing, we've seen that they've been wanting to do this. Uh, besides maybe, I think, again, like crapping out a couple uh, iOS games, I think they did a Contra game that was received really bad. 
Recent, um, right? Yeah. Yeah, I want to say it was like a weird top down that Hardcore, people hated. Something like that? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, so which people hated. And again, uh, so it's weird that they're able to just give away <laughs> some of their IPs, but the ones that people want, they are protective over. So, which rightfully show should be great. So, I mean, we'll see what it is but within remakes and, and new installments and what these franchises are franchises that, that should be alive and well um you know not annualized or anything but if every six seven years we get a, a metal gear game a castlevania games hopefully a little bit more i you know i there's a right balance to it and i think the fact that they're not just crapping them all out at once and being here like here you guys want this here it is and now you guys didn't buy it i think they're taking their time i think rightfully so um so it's exciting to see what what comes from it and which one's first is always uh, an exciting one for me. Yeah, for sure. And then when I originally read this story, a lot of my mind went to was what what do I think Konami's strategy is going to be here? And considering looking at their like the Contra collection, the arcade collection, and the two Castlevania collections, that tells me that they do understand their heritage and a lot of their value and contributions to the game industry lies with the nostalgic you know '80s and '90s releases of what they did in mm-hmm. the early 2000s. Uh, and so it makes me wonder, with these new entries, are they going to use the collections to kind of uh, reignite fervor in the franchise and then offer something brand new just now that the IP has a little life in it? Or are they going to do something more akin to like a Crash 4, which is release the original trilogy and then release something in the same spirit as that as a new addition to that trilogy, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um and so, you know, like when you go to places like uh, Silent Hill, there are lots of reasons why you'd probably want to update a, a little bit, especially where uh, survival horror has gone with like Final, uh, not Final Fantasy, I'm stupid, uh, Resident Evil. Um, uh, how how much that's kind of advanced since those days, where you probably want to put a fresh coat of paint on it. Uh, where like Castlevania, for example. Um, it's a little trickier because if you try to update it fully and go 3D, to be honest, and I know this mm-hmm. is not a take everybody shares, but I always felt that the best 3D Castlevania game you could possibly ever want is Bloodborne, to be honest with you, and De- and then Dead and yep. uh, Dark Souls. Um, that it, to me is the 3D successor to Castlevania. Lords of Shadow, I know, is a literal 3D successor to Castlevania, but when I think of what contains that brutal, dark victorian era spirit to it it's definitely dark souls and bloodborne um and so i feel like they don't really need to touch that i think a masterfully created 2d game can be super viable and super well received and if anyone has any doubts about that look at what nintendo's number one game out right now is it's metroid dread uh and Mm -hmm. it's completely top to bottom 2d side scrolling metroidvania game as classic as classic gets and uh it's phenomenally done and well received and so i think uh castlevania can absolutely be that um and you know bloodborne did that you know crowdfunded uh, with Ego, obviously, imagine what they could do with a significant Konami budget. You know what I mean? Like that—that that excites me. Um, and Metal Gear, the idea of a new Metal Gear without Kojima petrifies me. However, I feel like with an IP that size, they have to do it. Like to just leave it, either sell it or do something with it, pretty much. Um, but don't just leave it idle. It's too big. And you know, it, the question is like, what do they do next? Uh, they can't re well they can remake one but it's they've already remade one so they're in a weird situation kind of like resident evil was where like they randomly came out with resident evil 2 remake and everybody's like what about resident evil 1 it's like well they did it on gamecube so uh they they technically remade it already um and they already remade the original metal gear with twin stakes so i think they probably have to re-release twin snakes to some degree and find a way to do that before they ever touch a remake of two uh because you don't want to come out of nowhere with two and everybody's like okay sons of liberty is great but like where's the first one that's kind of weird so <laughs> yeah, yeah um, that's true. so that that's my guess is they'll, they'll have to figure that out first i don't know what the relationship with nintendo was with that because that was a gamecube exclusive from what i understand um mm-hmm. so they have to figure that out first uh, and if they can get like a proper PS5 port and cleanup of Twin Snakes and then do like a Sons of Liberty remake, that I think would be phenomenal. Um, because Metal Gear Solid 2 is one of my personal favorites. Um, I mean, I, I honestly like 1, 2, and 3. So, um, 
yeah, I, I think there's a lot of directions they can go with it, but uh, the it excites me just to see Konami have a headline that's not super negative because once upon a time they were all stars in the gaming industry and nobody would have guessed that they would have ended up so hated as they were uh, eventually. So th- this is good news overall. Yeah, no, it's it's all great news, and I I hope we don't have to wait too too long um for announcement. There's no more shows this year, I guess. I mean, I mean, there's game the, awards. Uh, game awards. Jeff Keeley's Game Awards, but... Uh, TGS happened, right? I think so. Yeah, TGS was kind of this past week slash kind of still going on, but it's kind of basically over except a few little things that trickle out. Um, so it's, we'll have to see. I would love to see something just out and over with, from one of these titles. Um, as long as we see something, I think it would be really exciting. Even if I'll take a tease at this moment. Um, so uh, going to the final story for today, and it's uh, something we talked about a while ago because... Oops, it slipped um, by Sony themselves. But uh, Bluepoint officially has joined PlayStation. So Bluepoint Games has officially joined PlayStation Studios. This was announced on PlayStation Blog by PlayStation Studios head, Herman Holst. They are obviously known for the PS5 remake of Demon's Souls, the, un- the Uncharted Nathan Drake Collection port, Shadow of the Colossus remake. Uh, they actually also did do the Metal Gear Solid HD collection for Correct. Xbox back th- back in the time. Um, so yeah, obviously Bluepoint is... Uh, it's been a big name. It's been something that people have always been talking about. That Sony needs to snatch these guys up for to have like a internal remake studio, which I also agreed with that. Um, there's that big Blue Points remaking Metal Gear rumor and that whole thing. Um, you know, so this was obviously was going to come obviously when, when they uh, bought out uh, or where they acquired Housemark. I think it was Studio Japan or someone accidentally said congratulations Blue Point. So we knew this was on the horizon. <laughs> yeah. We knew this was coming. It's I don't know why they waited so long. Um, but it's official, you know, everything's you know, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Um, the only strange thing and they're being very tongue in cheek on what Blue Point is doing next and they're saying it's a new game. Um, not necessarily a new series, they're just saying it's a new project. Um, they've been they don't want to say it's not a remake but they've been also not specific on like it's a new ip um so there's a lot of just a lot of rumors there's a lot of rumors that they're doing bloodborne 2 uh with because sony owns that but that was so it's just like a mixed bag of a lot of rumors but it's great that blue point you know is officially under that studio brand i think this is obviously again they also did a lot of work on vita and, and things like that so it's finally good to have them in in-house uh again not in the position i thought they were going to do uh but that may have been a bartering chip for all we know hey all right we'll we'll be part of the family but uh let us make our own game if that's what they desire to do who who really knows until it's announced which they just came out with demon souls so unless they had something really on the deck ready you're probably waiting two years before we see even a teaser from blue point but this is exciting news you know and i sent the text right to you when i saw this because i was like well we knew this was coming so obviously we were gonna have a a few thoughts about it. So, what did you think? Blue Point officially, uh, PlayStation Studios company. Yeah, I mean, one of the uh, pretty much a no-brainer. Um, one of the smarter decisions that you could probably do to add to your PlayStation Studio. I was actually just reading just now um, a list of the studios, and that they, they fit in there perfectly. You know, in terms of the different teams that they have and the different capabilities they have. Um, and you know, when people call them like a remake studio, it almost feels like an understatement because the sheer scale of what they can they can do is just like ridiculous i mean demon souls is a new game period and and though it is like you know a remake and tech on in the technical sense of the fact that demon souls did exist once upon a time the amount of work and care and polish that they're able to do makes their remakes indistinguishable from new games like if you took shadow of the colossus remake and just dropped it in somebody's hand who didn't know anything about that franchise it's like hey play it and they're they couldn't tell that that was a remake there's no way um, yeah, that's true. And, and so it's it's so incredible the amount of work that they they're able to do over there. And so I'm I'm just super impressed by them. And uh, I think it's a very 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 smart acquisition by PlayStation's part. And it also allows them the flexibility to. Um, and, and, and interesting is once upon a time, you know, like Ben uh, Ben Studio was like doing things like you know porting things to Vita and stuff like that. So now uh, now that they've made the jump, that void doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so mm-hmm. like you know, Blue Point can do smaller scale ports and also can do larger scale remakes because uh, they have the acumen to be able to do both, mm-hmm. which makes it great. So when you have teams like uh, 
Naughty Dog and all these awesome IP from back in the day. You don't have to worry about that team themselves having to do any of the legwork to have one of those games remade. So obviously, you know, that opens up stuff like like Twisted Metal from back in the day and stuff like that. Um, that like Blue Point can maybe play around with. And uh, so, no, I think this is a great thing. And uh, it, it shows that PlayStation's going to pretty much continue to have a steady stream of ridiculous amount of um, releases because now not only do we have brand new ps5 experiences but also remix that are probably going to be popping up so uh, i'm very happy about it yeah yeah no really exciting sorry constant's going outside my window <laughs> no problem um, <laughs> oh yeah it's super exciting i i'm excited to this and i i also do think i completely agree with you that calling blue planet remake studio is oh, beyond underselling them um, they did great with all the ports that they were given. And it's like we slowly saw them get bigger and bigger. They're like, all right, port some of this stuff, port some of this stuff. And then, you know, they gave them two of what some people hold as their games of, like, top games is forever. You know, Demon Souls and there's people who say Shadow of Colossus is their favorite game of all time. Top. For sure. Perfect. And that's a big thing. And I wasn't a big fan of the original Shadow of Colossus. And I loved the remake. <laughs> I absolutely adored that. I thought it was a great game. Um, same with Demon's Souls. I wasn't a big fan of the original Demon's Souls. Obviously on PS5 I played a little bit more than I did back in the day. Can't beat it because I, I, I'm terrible. <laughs> Me I'm terrible at Soulsborne games. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, brutal. Bloodborne was Yeah, Bloodborne was only the only one I ever was able to really get into. But uh, So it's exciting to see that, that they finally joined the team and I just think I also think it's time uh, it's kind of a separate story. I think it's time for both sides, Microsoft and Sony, stop doing all the acquisitions and stuff, and it's time to kind of, time to show like what, what what is it that where a lot of these guys are come you know working on. Not that I want things announced like seven years in advance, but I feel like these last few years have been beefing up both sides, and I think it's time to show like what can these sides do now with the funding, with the backing, and it's like what what do we have accumulating because. Uh, it's like we discussed last time, or maybe we didn't discuss last time. Uh, you know, the whole thing with initiative, yep, needing the backing or the help from uh, Crystal Dynamics, and it's like it's been a couple of years since that original job listing, quadruple A, that whole job listing that came out. Which, you know, that job listing still active on X uh, Xbox official, like the Microsoft like job board. It still says quadruple A uh, standards or whatever it was. So it's like. Now that we have, I think, especially PlayStation's got, like, you know, the PC porting studio. They got the the guys with the big, strong games. You have the people who can make, uh, like, Pixel Opus that I think can make these smaller titles that come out, VR titles. Yep. I think now that both sides are really, really stacked, it's time that we actually start seeing some, like, really great content from them. And I know that takes time, um, but I think there's different versions of it not everything needs to be a 70 dollars release not everything needs to be a 20 dollars release so i think we're in a good space and i think we're gonna be in for a big surprise and i think blue point blue points my i have my chips down on blue point that they they're gonna come out swinging hard uh whether it is another whether they are making a uh, a remake or a recreation of something or if they're doing a sequel to something following up we'll we'll have to really see what uh what it comes down from uh, both sides. Luckily for you and I, we we we, we uh, <laughs> we're we're in all three ecosystems, four yeah. ecosystems. You count other PC and stuff like that. So it's exciting times. Yeah, for sure. And and I, I love the point that you made about the fact that you know they're gonna come out swinging. And I really do feel like this is the generation where you know when they show a trailer off for the first time at like a Sony you know state of play or something like that, and they just show the studio icon and people are already losing their mind just because of what that means. When people see like Naughty Dog or like Insomniac, oh, people are like, oh, here we go. Okay, the Sucker Punch, Gorilla. These, these names mean something. People... I mean, imagine you see a brand new trailer and it says three four three. You're like, holy crap! Like, okay, this is exactly. gonna be something. And I yeah. really do genuinely feel that this is the generation where pe when people see mm -hmm. Blue Point, they're gonna be like, oh, oh okay. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna take one of our favorite games and make it better. Oh yes, I'm ready. Um, and and so that's what's really exciting to me is I feel like we are seeing another juggernaut kind of not being birthed because they've been around for a bit now, but really starting to come into their own. And there's uh been a number of teams that I feel that way about um, that are not quite there yet 
uh, and I like I honestly feel that way about uh, Bend personally. That I think mm-hmm. they will they will get there. They're not there yet, but I feel like once uh, one day, whether it's this generation or the next, they're gonna really make a name for themselves. And I feel like this is Blue Point's moment. They're in the ecosystem now. They have the support directly from PlayStation, the direct PlayStation investment, um, and I, I feel like now we're gonna start seeing the. Uh, not ramification, but the fruits of their labor all this time of what it looks like when Blue Point puts something out with the actual full backing of Sony. I think that's a very exciting prospect because I don't think we've fully seen that, but they've obviously worked with Sony with like Demon Souls and stuff like that. But what does it look like from the ground up as a first party PlayStation studio? Like, let's say they do do like um, Metal Gear or something like that. What does that look like? A mm-hmm. formally top to bottom funded by Sony blue point remake of metal gear i think that is probably one of the more revolutionary games to come out in in a decade maybe decade or two uh so yeah i'm I'm very excited about this acquisition and uh as of right now this is news that not a ton of people care about outside of the playstation ecosystem but i think over time people will understand uh the true weight of this story yeah i think so as well all right, so that was the five stories that we had for you guys this week. Really big week, uh, especially with the console release. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, fingers crossed, by the next episode, you'll have your OLED, and we can uh, take a swing at the story again a second time to get your full thoughts on it, because I'd love to hear yeah. what your thoughts are on the console and uh, Metroid Dread as well, because pff, that that's really good. And hopefully, if worst-case scenario, at least you can get a copy of Dread and maybe fire that up on your existing Switch so you could at least get a shot at it. So we'll see. Yeah, Dread I'm definitely so Dread I'm definitely gonna get it. You don't have to get the digital. Uh, I'll be fine. Great. My my little Amazon speaker dinged a couple times while recording, so maybe we got some good news. But we'll we'll see, we'll see after. Fingers we crossed. Yeah. What it equals. All right. So this was the Neo Vintage Podcast. I'm Jabro, and I'm here with Steve. Hope you guys enjoyed. And we'll see you guys in two weeks. Bye.